Um, okay, welcome to They've Made Us, a podcast that is a celebration of passionate people and the ideas that motivate them. I'm Helen Cheresky, this is Robin Ince, and in each episode we invite uh, two guests to each tell us about two people, which makes four in total for those paying attention, um, to tell us about two of the people who have influenced their lives. And it, they could be real, they could be fictional, they could be heroes. We think we're still waiting for a villain. Um, and so we learn about the world and this idea that, you know, we're all, none of us do this alone, right? We're all collections of ideas we often got from other places as well as the ones we came up with ourselves. Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing. We are here at the Royal Institution in London in the conversation room with a very enthusiastic audience. Audience, give us a chance. <laughs> Is it possible that some of you had a drink during the interview? <laughs> uh, yes. So, well, Robin, what have you been thinking about this week? Well, I was just uh, showing one of our guests this, actually, in terms of people who uh, made us. And this is my copy of The Goodies File. Because uh, when I was a kid, you know, on a, on a, on a previous episode, we were talking about Billy Connolly. And, and I think, you know, there are certain artists, certain TV shows, certain books maybe we had when we were kids that just, you know, one, they might have given us joy when we weren't having that much joy in the rest of our life. And the goodies were one of those things. And I just have this special copy here because this is signed by all three of the goodies. Because I did not did an event with Tim Graham and Bill. And, uh, and I suddenly thought, why have I never asked them? to? I'd, I'd never worked with all of them together. I'd worked with each one of them individually on separate things. And, uh, and I thought, why have I never asked them? Because you can sometimes feel a bit embarrassed about asking this kind of thing. And then I thought, well, that's just ridiculous. Because people like being told. Like I, I was doing an event in, uh, in Wivenhoe. And there was a lovely woman called Meg there. And uh, I'm doing the Felix Stowe Book Festival rather than Glastonbury because she seemed just very nice. <laughs> she went, oh, could you do that weekend? I went, well, I was going to do Glastonbury, but Felix Stowe sounds very promising. And, uh, <laughs> and then I was in the bookshop afterwards browsing, uh, which is not unusual, and she was in the same bookshop and she didn't know I was there. And she was going, oh, that was so much fun. I really enjoyed listening to that. And I went, hello, Meg. And she went, oh, my God, how embarrassing. I said, no, that's not embarrassing at all. Embarrassing is, oh, my God, I've accidentally booked him for the Felix Stowe Book Festival before I saw how awful his talk was, right? I said, that would be embarrassing. Uh, so, yeah, that bit of not, not being scared to kind of... Uh, and then, of course, Tim sadly died not that long after. But we did this wonderful... We did an event which was the 50th anniversary of the goodies, uh, and the public had voted for their favourite episode, and we screened it at the Red Grey Theatre with all three of them. And the thing that made it very, very special was that all three of them didn't like the episode that the public <laughs> favourite. <it. laughs> and so 500 people sat in a theatre listening to Bill Oddie going, well, this hasn't dated very well, has it? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I was just thinking, you know, there are so many people in my kind of cultural footprint that I can't, you know, you can't... Sometimes people go, oh, God, what? I watch those shows now, and I, 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 I don't know what I like when I was a kid. You go, you don't have to keep going back either. There was someone asked me that in a book event the other day. They went, there was one of my favourite books, and I don't know whether to go back to it. And I said, how old were you? She said, I was 12. I said, you could take the risk, or you can keep it as that thing that was... Because our brains change, our minds change. It doesn't mean that what you liked was rubbish. It just means that you're not quite what you were then and um, that might now be you know not what you need what was the good what was the goodies episode was it ecky thump yeah it was yeah 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 <laughs> Which does have some problems in it as well. <laughs> the, uh, I thought it was but the interesting that thing that once you create a thing, it then goes off on its own almost, and you yeah. it, you in it sort of separate a bit, and you might go different directions, um, and you you know that it's a weird thing, isn't it? I guess we all do this in some way. You know, we find our childhood picture on a, a wall or something, but it's other people look at it and they think other things, and that's okay because it's kind of when they look at it, it's their interpretation that matters, and you just have to go. You know what? I'm I'm over here, and and it's over there, and it's all right. People think different things about it. But it's weird, isn't it? You well, it's like people who people of our age who go, oh, Doctor Who nowadays. 
and you go, you were nine. What, what are you doing watching Doc 2 if it's a problem for you? There's loads of other things to watch, right? You, you are now, you're a 54-year-old man <laughs> complaining about, you know, problems with the Daleks in terms of the continuity of the narrative. And really, if that, just watch someone else then. You know, there's that, that wonderful word that my friend Toby taught me, anticipointment, the excitement, <laughs> the excitement of being let down by something you pretend to love. And I think there's far too much of our life spent with that, you know, that what you should do, you know, don't, don't be excited by other people letting you down. Be excited by finding the richness and the glory and the delight in things. That is wonderful. You reminded me of the time I was chased by a, garlic, a Dalek, not a Dalek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot. <laughs> The same thing would apply at the Cambridge Science Festival, um, and it was wandering after me, shouting at me, and I walked up the stairs, and it was the most satisfying thing <laughs> I've ever done in my life. <laughs> it was brilliant. Um, anyway, we should meet our two guests this week. It works for garlic as well. Anyway, so our first guest this Genesis week... of the Garlics is an episode I'm thoroughly looking forward to, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm very tired and now I'm laughing too much and this is all going to go, this might be entertaining for all of you. Um, so right, so our first guest this week is uh, Jay Wilgoose Esquire, the driving force behind the band Public Service Broadcasting, who I'm sure you're all familiar with and um, most memorably for taking samples from old public information films, archive footage and propaganda material, which is the best bit, the propaganda material, just as a concept, um, and remixing them to make these dramatic audiovisual pieces. Uh, and especially you may have heard their Race for Space a few years ago, which was an amazing retelling of the US and Soviet space race. And our second that guest... Was, can I just say, one of the things that I loved learning from that album, and I've loved all your albums, Jay, but one of the things that I loved was that Kennedy's speech is a bit rubbish, right? Because we always say the bit, right, we choose to go to the moon, and it stands out. But actually, he says, we choose to go to the moon and those other things. <laughs> and you go, who said... <laughs> No, lose the and those other things. I mean, talk about the other things afterwards, but you've really screwed up. There. Don't you think? I mean, when you listen back to that, that's such an interesting bit, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, there's no easy way of taking it out either because it doesn't make sense if you take it out. So there's no, there's no way of editing it out. You have to leave in that, that purely kind of extremely kind of mundane detour. Yeah, it, it kind of ruins what is quite lofty oratory otherwise. But, but you know, we're all human. I love what are the other things? A thicker mayonnaise. Well, well, hang on a minute. The moon, yeah. To be fair, he has just spent quite a long time listing those other things. So he was talking about the other things that he was talking about, but um, for reasons of space and boredom, I had to cut them out. It's still the kind of a weak ending to a piece of orange and some other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we can get back to the other stuff later. Uh, our second guest is Saifal Islam, who is a battery chemist. It will be familiar to many people here, of course, at the Royal Institution as the 2016 Christmas lecturer, giving us topic, uh, lectures on the topic of supercharged fueling the future. Um, he's a professor of material science at the University of Oxford, and he researches the materials needed for a clean energy future. And he has a world record called, and a, with, by, for, for a battery with lemons, perhaps you can tell us about the lemon Later, battery. I will do. I'll squeeze it in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, this has Thank taken you. an ugly turn, hasn't it? The, uh, I said I'd get a pun in. The, um, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you promised did. two puns, didn't yeah. you? Which now is a level of jeopardy hanging over this for the next hour. <laughs> um, but I, what was, we had Sue Black on the other day, and I was just wondering, what, what was the, uh, the best ridiculous request you had? Because I'm, I remember doing uh, Sophie Scott's lecture, and, you know, she'd managed to get a couple of crows in. There were some ballet dancers who also played chimpanzees. You know, the green room was the most fantastic circus. What, what was your kind of like, right? It always, as Sue mentioned, it relates to animals. So my theme of the lectures was energy. So number two was energy around humans, around animals. And we had to get in, they wanted to get in, a cow and a horse into the lecture. But they managed to get a cow in, but she uh, had to get into the lift, come up <laughs> and get into it. So we had a cow and her calf in our lecture. So that was the most ridiculous one. But uh, thankfully... It was the best thing that we ever did because I'm not an animal scientist, but it was actually a beautiful lecture dealing with that kind of animal science aspect. So that was a, the highlight. the science of how to get cows into Yes. <laughs> it was a lovely sign. I, can't, I wish I could find it. A lovely sign that um, do not disturb cows in the lift or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Was it something, wasn't it an experiment which was started with you swallowing a fly? And then you had to show medically how you dealt with that situation. It wasn't a fly. Um, that episode, you're right, I had to fast for a whole 24 hours. 
because they wanted to put one of those oral kind of microscopes, whatever it's called, and they wanted to track it in real time from my mouth right down to the lower intestine. So we had footage. So I've got footage of the insides of me from my mouth with that small microscope. This is great. In the last uh, po podcast, we discovered that Robin had a brain because they checked, and now we've discovered that yeah, you've yeah. got a lower intestine. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Checked. Brilliant. This bit was obviously the footage as it came out the other end. Yeah. Yes. Did that get used? <laughs> that bit didn't get used. Yes, yeah, so I'm <laughs> that. Well, Good, that. right. Well, we've set the tone of the, uh, the starting place. Oh, come on. You <laughs> love talking place. about poo. You Ooh, love about yeah. Whole year talking about whale poo. Yes. Yes. It's very important. It is very important. So don't suddenly get all... You know, I discovered the other day, penguin poo is important too. Penguin... <laughs> well, not only do projectiles... There's this whole thing about projectile penguin poo. There's a genuinely a scientific paper that's got... They have very... They, want, they need to get it away from their nest, right? Because, you know, it's relatively toxic to them and they don't want to have it all over their eggs. So there's, they use pressure to, you know, to solve this problem. And there's genuinely a scientific paper that's got a little picture of a penguin with a pressure vessel on the inside, and it's labelled P for pressure, and then there's a little parabola of uh, fluid going that way, and the paper is all about the pressure you need to form inside the penguin to get the poo that far away. But there's a new paper <laughs> out this week that talks about how the iron in penguin poo um, helps to fertilise the surface of the ocean. Uh, it's, very, it's very important. So the penguins and the whales, their, their poo is fertilising things. That's my point. I was very excited about no, it. I think it's great that news. I think, uh, no, no, I think it's great news. Jay, uh, what's the latest thing in uh, your poo news? <laughs> <laughs> You've got a baby, I believe, at the moment. So I imagine that's... Uh, have you had that one where they do an incredible projectile one, which actually, like, kind of fires out and breaks a window? <laughs> It's one of the most amazing things. I, I, <laughs> well, you, really, uh, you're not given the right diet. <laughs> I found one of the scariest, really when my son was a baby, uh, one day his bottom turned blue, and uh, my wife was very, very worried about the fact he had a blue bottom. And uh, then we realised he'd just eaten a load of blueberries. He'd, merely, he'd, he'd eaten so much, basically, dye, that uh, his bottom had turned blue. So then we gave him beetroot the next day, and that returned the balance. <laughs> Okay, let's get to the bit, uh, let's get to the, the guests, that the, the influences on your lives that we're talking about. So, uh, Jay, let's start with you. Who is your first um, person you'd like to tell us about? Well, neither am I. I'm, I'm a musician by trade, remarkably, most remarkably of all to me. Um, but neither of my chosen uh, guests are musicians. Um, and the first is George Orwell, who clearly is not a musician, and clearly a... Uh, a writer, and a, uh, a novelist, an author, a broadcaster, but certainly not known for his musical output. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I find him to be—I find so much about him to be incredibly inspiring. And um, I think the first thing—he was basically the first author I read whose book contained ideas. You know, I think I was 12 or 13, and I'd, pretty much everybody here must have a similar book that means as much to them when they discover that it's not just a vessel for you know. Megan Mogg and this and that and the other. It's, you know, it, the power of, of a strong idea within a book and how a novel can have a story and it can have characters, but as well as that can have kind of ideas that shape the way that you think and the way that you feel about the world. And for me, Orwell's 1984 just kind of blew all those doors open. And I think as a character, as a man, he was extremely, you know, he's a remarkable man. I think his, his clarity of thought, his, um, his, his, uh, his ability to kind of see through fashionable lies. Um, he, we, we don't really have a modern-day parallel of him. I think we're much the weaker for it. And, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a source of continual uh, wisdom and inspiration to me. He, he, the main thing I take from him is uh, a book from one, uh, a saying from one of his... his um, I think it's from one of his letters, which is just that our job... No, it's from one of his essays. I beg your pardon. Our job is to make life worth living. And I think uh, there's never been such a concise but true sentence as that for me. You know, what, what are we here on earth to do? What, what is our purpose here? Our job is to make life worth living for us and for the people who surround us and who we love and care about. One of the things that, thinking of the fact that, of course, you do sample fascinating voices, it seems to me quite remarkable there is no recording of George Orwell's voice, as far as I know, and he did a series of war broadcasts. You know, he did... But the, as, it seems very strange that someone from the 1940s who created so much, and indeed appeared on radio so much, that there's, there's nothing of, of the sound of his voice. Well, if you're as sad as me and if you rely as much on kind of early archive broadcasts as I have, then you'd learn that, yeah... Early, early recordings of that nature are just very hard to come across. There was no kind of easy technology for recording it. 
I think a lot of it was having to go onto cylinders at that point. I don't, there wasn't kind of a, an easy record of transmission. So yeah, his voice and, and a lot of others kind of lost for the ages, really. Um, yeah. Sad. And how do you feel about... I mean, I think one of the things, you know, George Orwell was not writing in 1984, he was writing before that, and yet the problems he writes about haven't really gone away. How does that... Does that does, do you find that sort of um, reassuring in the sense that, you know, we're all humans muddling along together, or do you, do you find it kind of depressing because these big ideas, these problems that were pointed out in the ways that humans behave back then are still, still apply now? I don't, I mean, it's an incredibly depressing book on a number of, <laughs> in a number of ways, but I don't think I find it depressing. I think that the main thing that I take away from it and the thing that is the most powerful thing about it, I think, is the way that it describes how the way that you think and the language that you think in can shape your whole thought process and your whole thought patterns and how you can be a product of your environment from a linguistic point of view as much as anything else. And, you know, to a, to a 12, 13, 14-year-old who's only ever dabbled in sort of, you know, science fiction up to that point... It was just, you know, it was kind of, to, to borrow a kind of contemporary of his phrase, it's kind of the doors of perception being blown wide open. It was really, um, yeah, it's, it's such a powerful idea and, and perhaps seems so obvious perhaps to other people. It's, it's um, you know, it's kind of workaday to a certain extent, but, but the idea that you could kind of redefine the way that your populace thinks by removing certain words from their vocabulary, um, it's extraordinary. And, it, you know, it, it can be done. <laughs> it does happen. We see it. Well, that's that thing, isn't it? Where every, every time that I see, particularly during this this current UK government, you know, the the, the choco rations lines in 1984, where people keep believing their choco rations are up when in fact they're decreasing. And as I walked around the supermarket today, I noticed how many shelves were totally empty. Uh, you you can't. I mean, that that's a fascinating thing to me as well about. Um, Orwell, which is that Orwell is now used by people on both political, all political sides. Uh, and I think misinterpreted a great deal by some of those, like I think of someone like Peter Hitchens, you know, who was a young Trotskyist, and like most young extremists, then eventually becomes an older extremist on the other side. But ultimately, they meet in the middle. Is that, I don't know if that's litigious or not, but I'll just read some of his <laughs> terrible, strange articles. Um, but he, you know, it's it's like he's managed to carry all well with him from Trotskyism through now to the Mail on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favourite bad take on Orwell is I think Anne Rand, and I've never read any Anne Rand, and it's for this reason. Uh, I think she accused Animal Farm of being uh, pro-communist. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so I, it's always been misused and always been misjudged. They're long books, first of all. Who's got time for the Fountainhead if you haven't done Infinite Jest yet? And and then there's that other thing, which is there's a wonderful. If, if any of you don't know Daryl Cunningham, have you come across Daryl Cunningham? Great cartoonist. He did a wonderful book called Science Tales, brilliant book called Psychiatric Tales, because he was a psychiatric nurse who then actually ended up within the psychiatric system as well when he became ill. And he did a book all about Ayn Rand and, and also her huge influence on so many, uh, like Alan Greenspan and stuff in American politics. And, you know, the thing is that she was that normal example of someone who has that kind of, everyone's got to be free and, do you know what, I'm free love and everything. And then if her partner went, oh, free love, I suppose I can go and have sex with that person as well. Not you! I have free love! And, and people who just leech off the system. Where are you living now, Ayn? Well, I haven't got any money, so I'm leeching off the system. You know, she, it's a total failure. Her life is a failure of all of her own ideas. Well, I think that's, that's another thing that's so compelling about Orwell is that he, he, he lived by the doctrines that he, he espoused. And he, you know, not, not, not just in terms of sort of, you know, clear, clarity of writing, clarity of thought. You know, he's absolutely savage in politics and the English language, which I don't know if, it, I don't know if they have read it, but clearly every politician should read it because it kind of, it really skewers political thought and political speech so accurately and still does. But there's not many writers these days, I think, who would show the bravery that he showed in going to Spain, you know, to fight in the Civil War. There's, whether, whether or not that's because that cause doesn't kind of exist in the, in the modern day to, to the extent they did back then, but he just... Um, he's, he's, he's kind of a, a man of conviction, a man, man of clarity of thought, man of perception, and, um, yeah, uh, endlessly inspiring to me. But, yeah, you, so you were talking about, you know, the, the power that comes with choosing words, but, of course, part of your work, your artistic work, involves choosing words from archives. Do you feel that sort of responsibility? You know, you're, you're obviously representing stories. Do you, do you, are you aware of, like, his eye watching you choose your words ever? Um, I mean, yes and no. I, I think I'm, I'm certainly aware of the responsibility of working with archive material and not kind of misconstruing it. I've always said that uh, when we use material that is 
you know, that has a kind of a, a, deep, a deep meaning to it, that, that it has some kind of connection to people, especially a sort of current one. For example, with the, with the South Wales record that we made about the, the mining industry, Every Valley, you know, to treat that with the respect that it deserves and, um, you know, not to, not to muck around with it, essentially. You're, you're using these people's voices. Um, but at the other end of that, there, you know, a lot of this, especially in the early days, the camper footage that we used, like um, for our song, All About the Wonders of Corduroy, which I'm advertising tonight. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't re really need to show any respect to her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a corduroy manufacturer somewhere listening who's just very cross. But also, they're, they're not my words. That's the kind of that runs through the vein of, of almost all of our work is that, that for, the, for the lion's part of it, they're not my words. Um, so it, it's, it's my responsibility to dealing with other people's words, other people's words, which is um, another kind of uh, responsibility entirely, I think. Um, but one that, does, one that does weigh heavily on me, nonetheless. I can't help but think the right-wing Illuminati are damaging your microphone yeah. Yeah. so your message cannot come across. But th what I wanted to, to uh, ask as well about when you started to... Because in the early days, you basically had a computer voice. Hello, you know, we, yeah, we are public service broadcasting. And then one day I saw you actually talking and I could see that you looked a little bit nervous, like, oh, my God, this is my own voice. And then when I saw you at Hammersmith, you did a very powerful speech about Orgreave about what happened to the miners during uh, the miners' strike. And that moment where you, st where you go, I can't, I'm not just going to rely on the archive or the, the computer-generated speech. I need to say this out loud myself. It needs to come from my mouth. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a gradual process, really. I think um, the first time I spoke on stage was when we were, we were lucky enough to headline Brixton, um, Brixton Academy, which, you know, as, as a South Londoner growing up was was my version of Mecca, I, I suppose. Um, and I always said if I got there, then I'd, uh, you know, I'd have to abandon any kind of pretense and actually just say hello and thanks for coming. Um, and then, you know, we, we kind of we moved from tackling quite remote things like the space race and, like, you know, World War II and um, into something that, that feels much more current, even though it's, you know, it's still sort of 30 or 40 years ago in, in, in the sort of the demise in the 80s of, of, uh, of well, industry in the UK in general, but specifically in our case, the coal industry. And um, it just, it, it didn't feel appropriate to be kind of larking about as much with a kind of generated voice. And it, it, it's, it's part of going back to that question about kind of treating the material with the respect that it was due. Um, so part of it was about trying to, yeah, trying to move away from some of the more jokey elements, I suppose, that, that we have that go with us. That are kind of used as a bit of an armour and a bit of protection and a bit of kind of uh, deflection from becoming too pretentious. But um, but when you are kind of going down that more serious road and trying to become a you know capital letters serious artist, um, you know there are certain things that you, you know certain considerations that come into play. It's a very powerful album, I think. The um, I want to ask all three of you this. You, you mentioned Aldous Huxley briefly there as well, and the Doors' perception. There's the book by Neil Postman uh, called "Amusing Ourselves to Death," which was written in the in the mid '80s. It may well have in fact been 1984, where he wondered whether the future was going to be similar to 1984, or whether it was going to be similar to Brave New World, which was the one that was going to perhaps you know the, these different, excuse me, visions of dystopia. So, uh, so what do you reckon in terms of visions of dystopia that we... Oh, right. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, well, one thing is certain about the future. It's uncertain. Uh, <laughs> but I, my, I try to be uh, an eternal optimist. So this dystopian future that George Orwell, who's a, a beautiful humanist, I, I am, despite my name, uh, a, prof a devout humanist, so he, had, he looks at the elements, the positive elements of humans, as George would. So I would like to think that rather than 84, 1984, the future that Orwell predicted more on a humanitarian ground would be rather than the brave new world aspect. What do you reckon, Jess? Uh, I can see a great deal of appeal, personally speaking, <laughs> in the kind of the, the numbing oneself with... with uh, whether it's entertainment or whether it's kind of, you know, artificial stimulants, sort of take yourself out of the horrors of the modern day world. And, and arguably, that is happening to a great extent. But then, you know, a lot of the things that Orwell predicted are also happening to a great extent. Whichever, whichever is the more optimistic one, and I'm not sure which one is the more optimistic book, I'd, I'd like to kind of err on that, on that side against my better nature, which is to be eternal pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know whether it's more cynical to go with Huxley on those grounds or, or Orwell. I'll go with Orwell because he's, he's my man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Helen? Um, I, so I 
I'm very much on the thing with the power of words. And I think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want it. I think the, the geneticists may or may not, like the sort of brave new world thing of sort of engineering people, it's just too much effort. But words can be manipulated far more easily. And so that's the thing that it's the 1984 version that, that bothers me most, is that people don't value words as they should. And then, and then the, the, the slipperiness of how easy it is to change words and to move words, that's easy to do. So I think basically it's the lazy dystopia. It's the minimum effort dystopia. And I don't, I know, it's not, it's not what I want, but that's the, that's the one I worry about more. Brave New World is conceptually interesting, and I think anyone who studies modern genetics should, should read it and think. Um, but 1984, it's, it's so, it's, you could see sliding into it, and it's all about devaluing words. And I, you know, I really care about words. It makes me quite cross, you know, I'm like, up for the words, more words, the right words, F honest words. You know, I think you know, we should have a campaign for honest words. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I wonder if it depends on how much cash you have, depending on which dystopia you're allowed in. <laughs> if you've got enough cash, you're allowed in the Brave New World dystopia. And if you haven't, you have to stay in the 1984 if you've got enough, If you've got enough cash, you're allowed in the robot dystopia that I've just ah, seen at the thing terrible, this week. Those terrible, <laughs> grasping robots you told us about <laughs> the other day. Um, and I just want to recommend, by the way, for Road for, to, to Wigan Pier, which I think is uh, a, a classic as well, by, by all well. If, if you want to read a modern version of that, read Stuart Hennigan's Ghost Signs. Uh, which is all about when he he's a librarian in Leeds and he um, th during the lockdown delivered food to all the most deprived areas of Leeds and I think is you know again shows that th these things remain pertinent. If we're if we're doing recommendations, can I recommend Dorian Linsky's book about 1984 about the writing? Oh yeah. Oh yes, um, we like. It's absolutely fascinating and, and has a whole section on kind of misinterpretations, either willful or otherwise, of his work. It's fascinating and it, and it certainly gives a great deal of context to how the book was written and its creation. Sounds brilliant. Uh, we, need, we need not only book lists, but book lists about the book lists now. This is getting very <laughs> meta. Um, OK, we, let's get on to Seifold. Who, who's your first person that you'd like, your influence? Well, part of your introduction, you introduced my research here. So I work on new materials for lithium batteries and energy materials. So I could not be at the Royal Institution without probably one of the most influential scientists to me, and that's Michael Faraday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Forgot to, um, so, uh, so my area is materials chemistry, but a lot of that materials chemistry is related to electrochemistry. And really, Michael Faraday, in this building, did some pioneering work on electricity, electromagnetism, and on electrochemistry. Um, also, um, you mentioned about humility and being humble. He came from very humble beginnings. He was a, so he didn't come from Eton. Didn't, he had a very limited education. He went to Eton College. Um, got him kind of self-taught. Got employed by Humphrey Davy, but rose to be one of the greatest scientists of all time. I mean, not just in Britain, but of all time. Um, it's believed. I don't know if it's true, but Albert Einstein had um, a, a painting or um, of Faraday in his in his flat or in his bedroom. Um, so in terms of science, he's had a big influence on my research area. In fact, um, in terms of battery research in the UK, there's a big funding institution funding a lot of battery research. I mean, its mission is Batteries for Britain, but it's called the Faraday Institution. So he's regarded highly um, in, in terms of the battery community. The other reason I, I picked him is really, again, because of what's been happening in the institution, is he was really a pioneer in what we now call public engagement in science. Um, he was really the first person to do outreach talks to the general public. Um, Robin probably knows the true story, but it's apocryphal that um, Albemarle Street became the first one-way street because the street was so busy with people coming to the lectures. I don't know if, if that's true or not, but it's, um, it's a really good story. Um, and obviously, I was very honoured and privileged to give the Royal Institution Christmas lectures. And it's the 80th anniversary that I presented them. It's the 80th anniversary of the TV. The TV lectures were first uh, broadcast in 1936, and I gave them in 2016. And because of the anniversary, they picked the theme of energy in, in honor of Michael Faraday, which was appropriate for me. And we, we call them supercharged fueling the future. So um, a truly great scientist, but also from very humble beginnings. 
But it's interesting, isn't it? Because he, what, he was a very, very good experimentalist. And I think one of the things that, you know, education can be great in many ways, but if you get too far into your, your equations and your theory, it takes you away from the real world. And what he was very good at was really looking at the real world. Like if you don't have too many sort of, if you don't have all these stern, you know, uh, scientists of the past looking over your shoulder, maybe you can actually see what's in front of you instead of over-interpreting it. And I feel that's, a, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel that's part of Faraday's story that he had to really look because he didn't have this, these structures, this framework that everyone else had in their heads, so he could see things and play with things in a way that others didn't. I think you're absolutely right. He was really, he, he was so smart in the sense that he, 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 he valued fundamental science, fundamental research, but he knew that that fundamental science was underpinning important applications as well. So, and you're right, he could really see different, I mean, he was a really polymath, I mean, he was, the first, I think, Fullerian professor of chemistry, but that doesn't actually explain his true title because he was involved with physics, material science, chemistry, so many wide areas. Um, um, and I just like the way that, because it, it, it kind of plays into my research, that you can do fundamental science, but if it's linked to real-world applications, it can make an impact. There's no real distinction between fundamental and applied in, in that sense, and that, I think he knew that that fundamental, sense, fundamental science eventually becomes applied because you need that fundamental understanding. I was reading, I think it's called The Philosopher's Tree, which is that collection of his, his, his writing. Um, and I didn't get... Uh, the one bit it said, and he did some rather unpleasant experiments on glowworms. Now, I presume that's probably something, you know, involving what powered a glowworm. Do you know anything about his um, unpleasant experiments on glowworms? No, I don't. <laughs> well, that's a pity, because I was... Uh, um, I'll lend you the book. Yeah. Um, and then, because it's like Tesla, there was a thing that he did with beetles where he worked out which was the strongest beetle. And then he would get these beetles and he glued their bellies to a little kind of conveyor belt. And then he used them to uh, power a little motor. With, uh, as animal experimentation goes, these ones have a, have a much greater kind of absurdity to them. The, you know, the, the, the 20th century, we moved into those really unpleasant ones. But gluing beetles by the belly to power a small lamp and finding out what powers gl glowworms are uh, both things that I spend a lot of my time doing. <laughs> you know, there's a paper where they've measured the pressure inside a spider. There's this amazing paper. So the um, spider's legs are hydraulic, uh, partly. They, they there's muscles that pull them inwards, but to push them outwards, the spider increases the pressure and it pushes fluid down, so the legs goes out. And there's this amazing experiment uh, relatively recently where they were trying to measure the pressure inside the spider that was pushing the the legs up. That's, by the way, if a spider dies, that's why its legs curl up, is because the fluid pressure drops and then the legs curl in because of rigor mortis. You all needed to know that clearly in your day. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, there's this great experiment where they, they put some kind of little pressure probe inside the spider and then they have to do things to it to make it move its legs. And so there's three stages to the experiment. There's the standing spider, which, you know, it isn't doing much. There's the walking spider, which is very gently doing the press. And then there's the startled spider. And I love the idea of someone, like, hooking a spider up to a probe in the lab and then going, boom! <laughs> <laughs> and, but this is it's real science, that is. I All thought right. it was going to be a tiny little hammer doing each one of the knees, <laughs> which I was quite <laughs> forward to. Um, they've got, but, you know, experimental science... Uh, insects apparently have their uses in experimental science. So what was, in, did, did you look at any, you know, Faraday, of course, did some quite remarkable yeah, lectures. Yeah. So you must have all the time felt like, like there's someone I know, who Eddie Glaude Jr., who wrote a book about James Baldwin. And of course, the problem with writing a book about James Baldwin is you think, well, James Baldwin was one of the greatest and most beautiful writers of the 20th yeah, century. Yeah. And the same way, you must have felt that tremendous pressure of going, right, I'm looking at Faraday's lectures. How do I make sure that this has the eloquence, the inviting nature of drawing people in? So it was a real honour to give the Royal Institution Christmas Lecture, but it was the most stressful thing I've ever done. It was, uh, uh, um, and you're right, it's that pressure, that pressure that you don't want to let the Royal Institution down, and likewise Faraday, and then you don't want to let the BBC down, and then you want to let yourself down, so there's that added pressure. Um, I looked back to his early writings. In fact, one of the gifts that the Royal Institution gave to me after I gave the lectures was a copy of his um, lectures on the chemistry of the candle. And one of the demos we did, we reprised one of his favourite demos about the chemistry of the candle. And it's really about energy. You can't create energy. You could only convert it from one form to another. So use the candle as an example of that. So you think that it's actually the wick that's burning, but it's actually the wax. And you can do that with a simple experiment. 
Um, try this at home. You cut a candle, actually quickly, um, actually take, you know, obviously take the flame off and try and light, have a match ready and just try and light, light it again, just with the, the, the kind of the smoke coming off. And that's just burning wax. And you'll actually relight that candle. So we reprised one of, the, one of Faraday's favorite um, experiments. And throughout the lectures, we did a few of Faraday's type of lectures because energy is about the ability to do work. And we used candles again, um, four candles, obviously. Uh, we did, we used four candles um, to do one around that kind of Christmas um, rotating bells thing mm. where you could use the candles to actually do work. It's kind of um, circulating that... Uh, that gold stirring thing, I can't remember what it's called. You anyway, know what you mean, it's, it's yeah, a yeah. kind of fairy merry-go-round, exactly. isn't it? <laughs> and that tra technically is something that could trip off the tongue of someone like me, but you're a scientist, <laughs> and you don't do as much fairy merry-go-round research <laughs> as I probably do. Exactly. I think you should walk downstairs and relabel all the things they've got in the museum yeah, downstairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to bring up fun. lemons. When life gives you lemons... Right, then I'd describe the yeah, battery, go on, you haven't so described it So on lecture three, the premise of lecture three was energy storage, and I appear at the front door in this beautiful electric vehicle, smart, kind of sexy, sporty vehicle. But we wanted to show how a battery worked. And you could do a school experiment with one single lemon. You can stick in a copper nail and a magnesium strip or a zinc nail, and you can create a voltage. And I said to the institution, I don't want to do a single lemon. I don't want to even do a few lemons. Can't we go large? And we went large. I got my group in to buy 1,008 lemons, and we cut them in half to get 2016 lemon slices. So it's true cutting edge technology. Uh, and then we connected them all up, and we generated 1,200, more than 1,200 volts. It was a new world record. In fact, the group said connecting them wasn't the problem. It was actually getting the IKEA shelving together was the trouble bit. <laughs> but, but two years later, a group in Denmark beat our record. Yeah. So I'm not saying I felt sour or bitter about this. <laughs> so uh, two years ago, the Royal Society of Chemistry approached me before COP26 as Cypher, we want to do something for schools, uh, an outreach. And I said, I want my bloody record. I want my, re <laughs> I want my record back. So we went to 3,000 lemons, 2,400 volts. So I've got the Guinness World Record back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But don't tell Denmark. <laughs> All the Royal Institution, you didn't notice that other bit going, I didn't notice the thousand litres of gin as well that he's ordered. <laughs> it's just for after the experiment. Oh, well, let's... Uh, yes, yeah, so now we've done... Have you got any lemon world records? <laughs> no. Wow. That is such a great... I'll tell you what, I've never seen anything more daytime than that. that, that yeah, that's our true, it is. Uh, Segway, hooray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, tell yeah, us... You must love lemons. Are there other citrus... <laughs> A friend of mine tells me something rather entertaining well, about is, you and a clementine. I wonder if you can tell us more about, about that. The thing is about this, the people we have on here, is that they often have, like, they often have the bonkers story. It's worth yeah, asking, yeah, right? Because yeah. it's totally Have you ever powered there. one of your keyboards with a series of lemons? Would you consider that? Would you two like to do a duet I now love, of I islands love. in the stream? I feel, I, like in so many areas of my life, I feel so out of my depth. <laughs> <laughs> Not with lemons, you won't. <laughs> uh, okay, so who's your second person who's been an influence on you? Well, this is a much more recent one, um, and it's perhaps uh, illustrative that I've chosen two people who actually don't go by their real names um, for somebody who may or may not go by their real name uh, in their professional life. Um, but I, I made a record about Berlin. We made a record about Berlin, uh, which I, we wrote. I wrote it, actually, but we made it uh, three years ago, four years ago now. But I thought a lot of the focus is going to be on one of my musical heroes, namely Bowie. Um, and his kind of endless capacity for self-invention and uh, his, his mastery of the story and his mastery of the kind of the image of the rock star and his ability to just shake off one era and just move bravely into another. Um, you know, his kind of, his, his embrace of just, of, of sort of, it, it didn't necessarily matter if the stories that he told were true. Like, there's, there's almost no doubt that the story he tells about the genesis of the song Heroes is absolute codswallop. But it doesn't matter because it's a good story. <laughs> so much of music and so much of art in general is kind of hinged around that, that concept. But in the process of researching that record, I came across a much more kind of striking figure and a much more inspirational one, namely Marlene Dietrich, who, um, who was entirely her own invention, kind of from start mm. to finish. And, and 
almost her, her kind of her greatest performance was living her life as Marlene Dietrich, almost in character from kind of when she first emerged into the public consciousness with the, with the Blue Angel all the way through to her death in, in the sort of the early 90s. And, you know, her name was an invention, her, her kind of her account of her past, of her age, of her family, of her upbringing, all of that was kind of very carefully stage managed. But within that, she kind of shares with Orwell this, this kind of extremely strong conviction. Like if you look at how she reacted to being a German abroad during the Second World War and how she rejected Hitler's overtures, how she you know, kind of mucked in with the Allies and, and performed for the Allied forces in Italy and elsewhere, and strongly with, withstood those kind of overtures from her homeland, even though her mother was still living there, um, at great personal cost, I'm sure. Um, and as, as well as that kind of putting up with the brickbats that were thrown at her when she, when she went back there in the 60s to tour, when she went back to tour in Germany, they were shouting tracer at her. That somebody stood up to the Nazis, you know, they're spitting at her in the streets. And she has the strength of character to put up with that. And not only that, but when she's, towards the end of her life, clearly, lived in America for the vast majority of her life, uh, and then Paris as well, she decides to be buried in Berlin. It's kind of the ultimate, like, two fingers, really. I will, I will go where I want, do what I want. I'm in charge of my story. I'm in charge of my kind of my creation, and I don't need to be beholden to any, anybody, especially any man. And in, in her era, to, be that, to have that kind of strength of character and that strength of purpose as a woman, I think, is quite remarkable um, to be able to do that. Uh, I, just, I, I just found her endlessly fascinating as a character, and... and um, yeah, it was, it, that was the real discovery of my time in Berlin, was just what a remarkable figure she was, you know, beyond the films, beyond all the kind of popular knowledge of her, just what, what a sheer force of will she was. She is. A, my, my dad saw her, I think, at the Wimbledon Theatre. I think it was the Wimbledon Theatre and said it was the most remarkable. Might have been to Café de Paris, but it said, you know, and, and whenever I was back with him, we would very often watch, I mean, these incredible, especially in the 60s and on, onwards, where she was in a lot of pain and she was very, very thin. And the way that she had to come on stage was angled very, very carefully because mm. of everything that was going on. I mean, really, the power... It's interesting, because we were mentioning JFK earlier. There's connections everywhere. I don't know if you've ever read Kenneth Tynan wrote about uh, Marlena Dietrich talking about having sex with John F. Kennedy and uh, how let down she was. Considering she'd been about 20 years older than him, he had no energy whatsoever. By the time they got his corset off, uh, it didn't last very long, and he then went straight to sleep, and then she went to go and do a show in Washington. You know, so, I mean, like, <laughs> that... that <laughs> you know, we're talking there as well about her, you know, at that time. It reminds me also of Hedy Lamarr as well, who's another kind of, you know, fascinating, you know, someone who was interesting scientifically, someone who had to battle through an enormous number of things in the way Hollywood worked. You know, there's, there's some of these stories are stories that must not be forgotten because these people were, weren't just film stars. They were true trailblazers, I think. I, I, I would definitely recommend... As, as you said, they're sort of, you know, very carefully stage-managed entrance at Wimbledon Theatre, but I'd recommend reading um, Rory McLean's book, Berlin, Imagine a City, which was a big part of the inspiration for, for our record. Um, and he has a chapter, he worked on the film. He, he not only knew Bowie in the 70s and lived there and sort of fraternised with him when he was there, but he also kind of then developed a career in, in film and ended up working on Just a Gigolo with, with Bowie and Dietrich, although they were famously never actually in the same room um, and didn't actually complete a scene together. But his description of her, her entrance as, as a sort of a frail old lady and then her, her kind of... She gave all the directions to the makeup team. She gave all the directions to the lighting team. She entirely set the scene for how she wanted to be portrayed, which, again, is extremely rare. And then the magic that kind of clicks in when, they, when the, the camera is rolling. The way that he describes it is far better than anything I could, I could kind of do now. But um, it's, it's, just, it's just that kind of... That micromanagement, that, that kind of... That degree of control and discipline, I find it uh, inspirational. <laughs> yeah. And where did it come from in her? So I don't know her early story, but a lot of the time, you know, with these people, and there were a generation, I think, that came out of war, of like really, I don't know about her case, but, you know, really extreme situations, and the, it was a survival mechanism almost. In her case, what, what was it that drove her into it? Was it necessity, or was it just, you know, that's the way she was? I, th I don't think she had any particular kind of um, tragic upbringing necessarily. I don't think she had any particular hardships. You know, she was she was born in sort of suburban Berlin and, um, you know, sort of relatively nondescript house, which I went to see and sort of, you know, there it is. Um, it's nothing particularly to remark about. I, I d I d it's really hard to, to get into somebody's psyche, especially when they've so carefully protected it the way that she did. Um, 
but it's clear that it was there from a very early age. You know, ev even creating her name, had, you know, calling herself Marlena happened at a very young age, 10, 10 or 11. But she's, she's so kind of ruthless with it and so selfish with it, which uh, perhaps I shouldn't admit to, but I find it quite, quite inspirational. Because mm. you have to be, if you're in the kind of creative sphere and if you have kind of codependence, if you have family, if you have all the, you know, you, you have to be selfish to actually get anything done. Um, she kind of took that to the nth degree. I don't think I'd ever want to go as, as far as she did. But you read her biography of her life. She's got all these photos, you know, in the kind of the center pages or whatever. And um, she's got her with her mum and dad. Then you read her daughter's biography of her life. And then you realize that Dietrich has cut her sister out of the family photo. because She doesn't want to admit to her sister's existence for some reason or other. Uh, her kind of degree of control over, over every aspect of her life, it's... Yeah, it's remarkable. But it's interesting as well, isn't it? Because we live in an age when that kind of reinvention, you know, things can be photoshopped, the social media, what's projected on social media is very... I mean, it's a, it's a very modern thing in a way, that back then perhaps there were fewer opportunities, there were fewer you couldn't hide quite as easily because you were physically there in person and people knew what was going on and you lived in small villages as gossip. And, and maybe that's just, you know, it's a more modern representation now that... We live in a very contrived world, you know. If you if you believe what you see on Instagram or TikTok, there's all these entirely fabricated fabricated lives and existences, and it's perhaps a very modern thing to do. Maybe she was just, you know, 80 years ahead of her time. Perhaps, yeah. But but I should I should say, you know, in going back to why I admire her so much, it's it's not just about her kind of her artistic, um, you know, her sort of self creation and self invention. It's it's as much about the character of her during those war years and, and how much it must have took to, to stand up to, you know, to, to Hitler. I mean, <laughs> clearly a formidable figure in history, to say the least. Um, you know, and when, you're, when your mother is living in that country and you know that, that that person in power could make her life a misery or could even threaten that life, and you are prepared to kind of stand up for your, your values to the extent that you're, you know, you're willing to reject those overtures and just and, and actually actively campaign against it, even when that kind of leads to your total rejection from your country of birth. I'm just in absolute awe of, of that strength of character, absolute awe of it. There's someone, again, people might think, That's, this isn't the same at all, but Ingrid Pitt, who was, of course, most famous for things like Countess Dracula, the Hammer movies, Who Dares Wins, Where Eagles Dare. Her autobiography, which is, as far as I remember, it's called It's a Scream, might be Life's a Scream, I think it's It's a Scream. Most of the story is actually about her and her mother in a concentration camp in Germany. And, again, the, the, this person who, for many people, they would imagine, see as a B-movie, you know, loved, of course, because of Hammer Horror and stuff. But, again, that tenacity, that strength of character, that, you know, the reason that after Where Eagles Dare, she didn't become a star in Hollywood was because she would just slap anyone in the face if they tried to do the casting couch route with her. You know, and, and again, she's just another woman as well as Hedy, Hedy Lamar that I just think there are so many of these stories and, and I think, you know, the, the power that they can give to people is you see that this is through the 20th century, those people who did not obey the commands of those who felt they were in charge and made huge successes of themselves. Is, I really do. The, the, the Ingrid Pitt book is, uh, is, is remarkable and brilliant and not what people think it's going to be. Brilliant. Well, let's move on to our fourth uh, guest person today. So, Seifel, who's your second pick? So, I was debating, I mean, in terms of my second invitee, um, it, was, I, it was a toss-up. I, I want to go back to my teenage years and my student days to find out what really had a big influence on me. And there was two big influences in terms of science and indie music. So, it was a toss-up. I, I can't sing, I can't play guitar. But the influences to me, my, my band, that favorite band still is, is the Smiths and Morrissey. Uh, uh, there's a hiss there. But <laughs> I, went, I went back to my uh, teenage years, a bit earlier than my student days. I was thinking, I was growing up as a second generation immigrant. My parents were first generation. They came over in 64. And s I grew up in a place called Crouch End, North London which was rough in the 60s and 70s. Not so rough now, it's now quite trendy. It's now called Crouchond. Uh, <laughs> and in the, six, in the 70s, I, there was a, uh, obviously a, a horrible time for a... There was packy bashing, and I was a victim of that. So we relied on kind of introspection. TV was very important to me, and there were fewer channels. So the person I've gone with is somebody who really 
and is a national treasure, and won't surprise anybody, and I'm hitting 60 this year, is David Attenborough. Um, so David Attenborough, I watched like everybody else did in the growing up 60s, 70s, and till, still to this day. And even though I didn't go down that route of biology, he had a big influence of me of what science meant to me. Uh, and because, uh, as my name implies, I am in a Muslim household, but I never felt any faith. So science was a way of trying to understand the world around me. And Attenborough was one of the few science programs on TV, as well as the Christmas lectures. In fact, the first Christmas lectures I remember were Carl Sagan, another great hero of mine. But anyway, Attenborough, you know, he just had that infectious enthusiasm that we all know, that really humility as well, that um, obviously natural communicator, and he can communicate with anybody, whether it's um, a five-year-old right up to uh, somebody much older. So um, I've gone with Attenborough because of how he got me into, or really reinforced my interest and love of science uh, away from faith. I think that's such a... It, it remind, I, I was lucky enough to interview him about 10 years ago. And it was a lovely person. It was there, I, I'm sure I've told the story before, but he, he was annoyed because he'd had to have knee replacements done. And because he was, at that point, a mere 89 years old or whatever he was, uh, they wouldn't do both the knees on the same day, which was like, this can take up too much of his time. And the fact that he'd worked out that he needed knee replacements because he was watching some footage of himself and realised that he was kind of walking like <laughs> yeah. a orangutan. He thought, oh, there must be something going on with my knees. The, the doctor, he went, went just... David, you haven't got any knees. You know, the fact that he'd gone through <laughs> years of just wandering around making these documentaries, and he just didn't really have any knees, knees left oh at, that, that, at that point. But the thing that I really adored about him was that um, after we'd finished uh, recording the interview, I just mentioned that my dad had a Folio Society book that David Attenborough had, had brought out of, of uh, Edward Lear's illustrations of birds, these, these incredible illustrations of birds, and his face just lit up. That excitement that he... This thing he'd made was being shared. I said, my dad absolutely loves it. He went, oh, does he? Really? This is so wonderful. Because he wanted to share, like in all of the broadcasting we know that he yeah. does, uh, he, wa he wants to go good. I've, you know, to ignite something in someone else is, is such a beautiful thing. Yeah. And the, the fact that he still has that, yeah. and of course with the stuff he's doing in, in terms of climate change yep, yep, as well, yep. it's just... I want, yeah, you're right. I want to bring up the fact that my area is to do with low energy and uh, green energy, and the fact that in the last five or ten years, he's really become such a campaigner on climate change. I mean, I think he realizes that, you know, he's in the twilight of his, his life, and he, he wants, to, he's got, already got a legacy, amazing legacy, but he w wants to remind the world that the evidence around um, human-induced climate change, and he wants the humans to make an impact to make a difference, and I, I, I admire him for that as well. He could have taken the easy route and just carried on making his documentaries, but he has become a campaigner, which, you know, fantastic in terms of his, he's using his platform to do that. He is very enthusiastic. I had the privilege of uh, seeing the ship that is named after him as it was built. So, the, so the Brit Britain's uh, polar research ship, the most recent one, is called the Sir David Attenborough, known as the SDA by polar types. Uh, and it's a very large, very big red ship. Um, and he was so... I was on it when it was being built, and then I spoke to him afterwards, and he was so excited about the ship, not because he wasn't really interested in it being named after him, but because of what it could do. Yeah. He, was in, he wasn't interested in the things that... He had no ego about it. He was like, but it can do things. You know, and he was interested in where it could go and what capabilities it had and all that kind of thing. And I think, and it was, you know, it, it, that thing is, I think he's never stopped being interested in the practicalities in a way. Like, what can it do? What, where's the, yes, it, you know, there's things that, it, there's great poetry. And I think he goes, there's a, um, I wouldn't say birds of passion, but it's not, is it? He's got f favorite birds. And I can't, birds of paradise. Birds of paradise, yeah. that's it, yeah. Um, but he's, he, so he's got that poetic side to him, but also he's very interested in like real world people problems and you know things that can be done. Um, it's very hard to, in a way, I'm surprised he hasn't come up before in this series because I think for all of us, he was very like... I, he, thought, I thought about him as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, did, I did check with Trent. I, thought, I was surprised. So I thought, well, I'm going to bring him up if it hasn't, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank heavens Morris has said what he said, otherwise we might have had... Yeah, him I, know. The, uh, I know. But, but Trent did mention about a villain, so I thought, well, I don't want to be on air having a... 
a go at Morrissey, but the Smith still, I mean, do you separate the art from the artist? And maybe, you yeah, you should. Yeah, you so you can separate. Hard. So I'm glad you can, because I still play the Smiths. But <laughs> Morrissey, Morrissey has let me down in the last few years. And it, it's painful because, you know, his, I, oh, I, I should say, I managed to slip in three Smiths titles in my Christmas lectures. <laughs> one in every lecture. So the first one I mentioned, The Sun, I mentioned There Is a Light That Never Goes Out. In the second one, I introduced Kevin Fong, this charming man, and in the third lecture, when I put on a glove when I do some welding, hand in glove. So I do slip in. The fourth one, when the cow died in the lift, <laughs> and barbarism begins at home. Meet, so meet his murder. Yeah, yeah. Meet his murder, yep. <laughs> but it is, uh, the, 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 but Attenborough, there is there's something about the humanity that the whole of his family have, I think, as well, because I think Richard Attenborough yep. had that as well. When you look at the films he made and the messages he wanted, and when you go and you sometimes listen to what their parents were like, the fact that you know they took in lots of people, you know, dur during the Second World War, they they were taking in refugees all the time, and they and it seems to me that they very much both of them were imbued with that idea of everyone is just a human being. Yeah. They are a human, and and that comes across, doesn't it? We had the other day someone, uh, uh, Sue Black, picked Billy Connolly. You know, and again, there's something about the curiosity, yeah. the humanity, the 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 excitement. It's never shtick. You know, sometimes you watch that, and then you you know you find out. And you go, oh, they're just pretending. And then I don't think there's any pretend, you know, with, with David Attenborough. One of the reasons I considered putting him forward for this as well is because I've got two quite young children at the moment. And I think back to an interview, you've got two books on this table, actually. Barack Obama interviewed David Attenborough, and he asked him what I think is a reasonably daft question, but Attenborough dealt with it very diplomatically. He was like, when did you first become interested in nature? Attenborough was like... We're all interested in nature when we're kids. It's the first thing we're really excited about. You know, the first thing you teach your children is animals, the sounds they make, you know, the world around us. All yeah. this. It's more, when do we lose that? Yeah. If we do lose that, how can we get it back? And that's, re that's really been on my mind for the last few years, trying to sort of, you know, explain the world to my, my two daughters. It's very yeah. interesting, actually, that it's when... So what I notice is that... Um, I, and I noticed this certainly in the TV world with commissioners, they were like, meh, about science until they had kids. And as soon as their kids were old enough to ask questions, suddenly it was like they had an excuse to become interested again. And I, and I think this is, is you know, why, why did you lose that? And of course, it's because the world pushes it out of us, right? You haven't got time to ask these questions. You haven't got time to just stare at the sky and wonder why it's like that. Like, we're sort of boxed in, but we sort of do it to ourselves. If you can remember to keep asking the questions, you never lose it. It's just a habit. But it is like, for some reason, kids are seen as an excuse. Oh, I've got a kid, therefore it's okay to do science. No, I'm an adult and I've got a, I've got a, this is true, I've got a sofa full of stuffed toy sea creatures, an entire box of science experiments, and I don't have any kids at home. They're for me. <laughs> you know, I think we sort of like... Your kids would hate you if you ever had them. Yeah. <laughs> Get off those, they're mine. <laughs> They're children's toys, they're not the Helen's toys. <laughs> you know what, the best things, I got the best, my favourite email today that I've had all week. Uh, so, that, you know, I, the, my book was published this week and I got an email from my publisher today that said, well, we were going to send you flowers, but instead we're sending you a stuffed toy sea creature. <laughs> <laughs> Which sea creature is it? Has it arrived yet? I don't yet? know, it hasn't arrived yet. Oh. I'm like, there's a sea creature on the way. How exciting is this? <laughs> sea doesn't have to go away. You don't have to be a boring adult and not care about these things. Um, we might have reached the end of the yep. podcast series. Yep, that's the end of the series. That's it. Yeah, we never had anyone picking Jimmy Barnes, but Trent would have picked Jimmy Barnes. Just hold that up there. Jimmy Barnes, working class man. Very interesting. Uh, have you got any other... What else? Have we, that's well, this is... Uh, did you know Jimmy Barnes at all, Jay? No, I just read the blurb there. And I was wondering... Timo Levy, would have, he, he was, Timo Levy uh, would have been a good choice. He's, he was uh, the lead singer of a, a huge Australian rock band called Cold Chisel and now does solo stuff. But you know when sometimes people... like I, I read someone recently saying, you see, the thing is that Jordan Peterson's a really good role model for men, right? Yeah, we won't go anywhere there. But <coughs> Jimmy Barnes really is, because Jimmy Barnes has lived a life that at times has been extremely hard, and uh, it, he has also been at the forefront of doing things like he worked with the uh, recently deceased, actually, indigenous singer, uh, Australian indigenous singer, Archie Roach, 
And when people went, I'd be careful if I was you, Jimmy, you might lose some of your audience. He went, great, I don't want them as my audience. <laughs> and, you know, and again, he's very much seen as you can see there, guy in a vest, and, you know, tough, uh, very tough, straight man who also would do the Sydney Mardi Gras. You know, all of that kind of thing where you go, these are the real role models, which are people who have, have had, you know, sometimes tough and difficult lives. And sometimes it is, you know, there's, there's a level that people believe that they're quite macho, but they are so strong within themselves. They go, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't mean I can't do Mardi Gras. It doesn't mean that I can't work with an amazing singer. And uh, so uh, Jimmy Barnes, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get him on the next series, won't we, Trent? Twist, <laughs> twisting the arms of the audience. What I like is that we've got a table here that's got both Jimmy, Gar Jim Jimmy Barnes, Barack Obama and Paddington Bear. Like, yep, yeah, yeah. This is the level we're at. Yep. This is the big one, isn't it? Blue Machine. How yeah. much is it available now? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the good. plug. Uh, but we really, we really are at the end of this. It's been really good. It's been good yeah. fun. We've yeah, no, I've enjoyed it a great deal. And um, what is what has been brilliant about doing this is that people have to think. Some people didn't have to think about their first pick. For some people, their first one. <laughs> oh, sorry, I should have done that, shouldn't I? Sorry, that's my fault. Um, uh, some people really had to think about their first people, their, their pick, and some people had to go kind of digging. And 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 it was almost a surprise to them in some cases that they'd sort of forgotten that they had that influence. And there was a, you could see the joy in them remembering why they'd thought that. And that it's a beautiful thing about all of this, isn't it? That people were you can kind of be reminded of yourself as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. No, and I think also it's that thing. So often people say these are my opinions or whatever they might be, and of course I don't mean on this, but you you go, no, they're not. They don't come out of an individual. They don't. They, again, they're not this kind of Aristotelian. I thought of that. We are all, and that that's another reason to try and engage with as many minds as possible. Is because the more minds and the more ideas you have, the more possibilities you have as well. Brilliant. Well. I think we have reached the end. So thank you very, very much to the Royal Institution for having us, for the audience who are here in the room, of course, to Jay and Seifal for being our fabulous guests for this final podcast. Um, Patreon plug, do support us on Patreon if you can. And um, that's it for this episode. Yeah, and do buy our books, though. Do buy <laughs> them. I mean, I, they are, you know, I've done a new version of I'm a Joke and So Are You. There's, uh, there's uh, Bibliomania and Helen's book as well. And, uh, yeah, and if you can support us via Patreon, we, one of the things that we're trying to do is just make sure that we can always make these freely available for people. And so if you can't afford to support us, that's absolutely fine. We're glad that you um, like watching the things that we do. And if you have got a little bit of spare cash and you can support us, that means that we can keep making it open for everyone. So thank you very much. And thank you to our producer, uh, Trent, and everyone else who's made this possible. Really hope you enjoyed that and we've got loads of other new ideas coming up we've got quite a few things that we've made already and we've got plans to make a lot more things and if you can help it would be great if you could go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles and if you can't afford to that's absolutely fine as well but if you can subscribe there'll probably be a subscribe thing there or there or there, or there uh, that would be fantastic as well